uh, Normanetta. Greg, thank you very, very much for your great introduction and thanks to Mike as well. But more importantly, Greg, I want to thank you for your um, tremendous energy and time and effort that you're uh, putting into the leadership of the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation. Uh, it's really been tremendous to see you take hold and uh, and I know the community appreciates very much what you're doing. And my thanks really are to all of you for taking time from your own very busy schedules to be here today. I know there are a lot of other things you'd rather be doing, like mowing the lawn or doing the laundry, <laughs> vacuuming, whatever. So it really is uh, terrific for you to take the time to be here uh, this evening. I would also like to especially thank all the members of Congress who uh, were here and who now have to dash off to a series of uh, two-minute votes. So uh, for me, it is um, fun to be able to return to uh, this building, uh, to stand here uh, and think and reflect on, on all of these great members of Congress with whom I had the privilege of serving as well as those who uh, dropped by tonight. To talk about the 20th anniversary of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 and what it meant to Japanese Americans and what it meant to this country, you really have to begin after the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Empire of Japan and specifically in the early months of 1942. Japanese Americans on a community-wide basis were singled out for official injustices that tore at the faith that my generation and my parents' generation had placed in the United States. And yet four decades later, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians determined that the internment of those of Japanese ancestry by the United States government, as Mike uh, Honda indicated, was a result of wartime hysteria, weak political leadership, and historical racism. But in 1942, we all knew was that all we all knew was that our lives, our businesses, our dreams, our loyalty, our trust were being victimized. And at that point, the yoke of shame and disloyalty was, was placed on the shoulders of every person of Japanese ancestry. But even with that yoke, we chose not to be victims. Japanese Americans chose to be American patriots even in the face of injustice, the belief in the principles of, uh, of America and the promise that it held out continued. Some said that this was tilting headlong into the gale of an irreversible windmill with no way of knowing when or whether that windmill could ever be turned around and provide a welcoming breeze at our backs. Japanese Americans chose to reinvest in America anyway, even as 120,000 of us from the Western states were forcefully evacuated and involuntarily relocated and ordered to live in 10 desolate internment camps. And despite this treatment, many thousands volunteered into the American armed forces from those camps joined by Japanese Americans from Hawaii. Unprecedented heroism resulted even as civil liberties were being shredded. As early as the mid-1950s, some of these stories could be told widely and were even by Hollywood. 
but it's only been in the last 20 or 30 years that the full measures of devotion in World War II by the Japanese Americans in service through the full 42nd Regimental Combat Team, the 100th Battalion, the 522nd Field Artillery, and the Military Intelligence Service have become even more widely known. Now, when the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, with the stigma of shame and that yoke, for Japanese Americans, civilians, with the passage of that legislation, that was finally lifted. But it wasn't always so. The journey began in unsuccessful court cases, which in turn led to a 1978 resolution by the National Japanese American Citizens League to seek legislative redress right here in our national's capital. It took 10 long years, and it took leaders like Dan Glickman, chair of the subcommittee in the Judiciary Committee, Speaker Jim Wright, my dear friend of over 40 years, uh, from San Jose, Congressman Don Edwards, a member of the Judiciary Committee. A 65-year friendship with my friend, uh, Senator Alan Simpson of uh, Wyoming, and Barney Frank, the late Henry Hyde, the late Sid Yates, and so many others who were not Japanese American, as well as those who were, like Senator Dan Inoue, the late Senator Spark Matsunaga, and the late Congressman Bob Matsui. Together, we built an understanding with the American people that the injustices of the internment were not Japanese American issues or Asian Pacific American issues, but that these were American issues. And by having the courage to address the injustices, we were creating a legacy that would help protect future generations of Americans from similar life-crushing, right-trampling mistakes. Being a member of Congress at that time certainly was educational in many unexpected ways. In the late 1970s, when tensions between the United States and Libya were running high and hot, I recall being in a briefing where the idea was discussed of rounding up Libyan Americans wholesale and putting them into an INS detention camp in Louisiana. And I thought, I'm sure that there was a con conversation just like this one in 1942, and that's how 120,000 Japanese Americans wound up in internment camps for the duration of World War II. Well, without going into more detail, let's just say that that re uh, internment uh, replay never happened. So it was true again in 1991, after Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Loyal Iraqi Americans, some politically active, with uh, pictures of themselves and President George H.W. Bush on their office walls, found themselves being asked inappropriate loyalty questions by the United States government. The broad coalition that had supported redress was reassembled, the practices denounced, and civil liberties protected. For someone who began this journey as I did, wearing my Cub Scout uniform, standing next to my family at the San Jose Freight Depot on May 29th, 1942, headed to parts unknown, and now standing here today, recalls perhaps the single most important act in my public service career that I wished both my parents had been alive to witness. And that was the signing of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 on behalf of the United States 
House of Representatives when the legislation was passed and I was serving as Speaker Pro Tem. But more than an overdue correction to the wrongs of the past, the timeless, germane legacy of this law to Americans today and tomorrow should never, never, ever be underestimated. Thank you very much. Thank you.